happy Girls Day on the podcast. Hey. It's Taylor and Stephanie here. Steph, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. What you sipping on? I got my energy drink. Well, this is pumpkin spice uh, Nespresso pod. <laughs> that sounds amazing. It is. I mean, it's 75 degrees outside. Hey, so. Yeah, it's, it's time yeah. for pumpkin spice. It's that time of the year. Um, even though you have your, you got like your turtleneck with your sleeveless, like perfect fall style. I'm into it. I'm very into it. Um, Steph and I had to do a little bit of an audible today because of news that broke this morning that had Mark and Justin and everybody else doing interviews. Um, I actually woke up this morning to a text from Stephanie with the news that the mayor's office had been um, not telling the whole truth about COVID numbers. Um, Stephanie, explain what happened and then we'll deliver our takes on it. So it's kind of been a wild morning um, to see how all of this has unfolded, but it's, so some places were saying that the mayor did not release the bar, real bar numbers um, of people that have actually gotten COVID from bars or restaurants. Um, that's not entirely true. There was a story in the Tennessee Lookout about um, the number of cases in bars a couple of months ago, um, or at least a month ago. But the real controversy is not about the fact that the numbers were reported or not reported and that they were in fact lower um, or pretty low in general. It's that they were making policy decisions saying that the science shows us that it's being transmitted at bars and therefore we have to shut these bars down and it's impacting people's livelihoods. And that turns out to really not be the case. If you follow the science, you should have been shutting down construction sites if that's what you were going to follow and not uh, bars and restaurants because it really wasn't shown to be showing in quite that way. And bars and restaurants are going out of business. We tried to go somewhere for lunch downtown the other day and they have altered their hours to only be open for dinner. I mean, it's really taken a toll. Yeah. And when you're making decisions about closing businesses down, like those are very serious decisions that should be based on data and actual science. Um, and that's kind of what they've been saying. And so it's not that they necessarily lied about it. It's what they didn't say when they had the opportunity to, when they were reporting everything else uh, to the public. And the fact that they have kept these businesses shut down at random capacities you know, you can have 25 people, but if you're standing on your head for 10 seconds, then you can have more. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. Make sense. And, uh, and so some emails came out amongst the health department and Mayor uh, Cooper's administration, and they kind of showed that, um, you know, they were nervous about releasing the numbers for bars and restaurants because it kind of didn't fit their narrative about um, shutting them down and, and where COVID was spreading. I mean, this is kind of a huge scandal. This has, this has been definitely a black mark on his administration as mayor. And now, I, I don't think anyone, I think the credibility is gone. And even in the press conference this morning, they were trying to still dodge the numbers. And Dennis Ferrier spoke up. He's a reporter for Fox 17. He said, this is America and people need the truth. And well, a point. that exchange between the mayor's communications person and uh, the reporter was probably the most insane thing I've watched live in a really long time. Um, yes. Totally unprofessional by the communications person, but also um, just sort of fitting this narrative that we've been hearing for a while that like, there's some hot tempers and, you know, things are getting a little crazy. Um, but I think at the end of the day, the public deserves to know where the cases are coming from, how many there are when people are making policy decisions that impact their lives. Um, one of the other things that I found interesting, you know, there's two stories that have always stuck with me since childhood. It's the boy who cried wolf. And if you give a mouse a cookie, and I think they're so um, <laughs> applicable during this, during the COVID pandemic, because people who we're going to need to trust in the future in, in high ranking places, by saying misleading things or misleading the public in any way during this pandemic, just hurts in the future yeah. for when we really need to trust them on something else. Yeah, and totally. it also kind of goes to, if you give a mouse a cookie, they're going to ask for a glass of milk. 
And it's sort of where these executive orders at the uh, city level have kind of gone to. It's like, okay, first we're going to do this and everybody's on board. But then you start to question, why are we doing this? What are the numbers really showing? We're down to a little over a thousand cases in Nashville. Yeah. And yet we were just now moving to phase three on October 1st and only after there was public outcry um, and pressure put on the mayor's office. And so when you look at these, the numbers of it, you know, there are almost 700,000 people in Nashville and we're talking about a little over a thousand active cases. That's less than one half of 1% of yes people that live in the county to say that we need to have anybody shut down is is an overreach in my opinion it absolutely is and you know i've had friends as i've been telling the story today people have been texting me the link to the article i've gotten it from so many people and they're saying what's why is he keeping things shut down why isn't he telling and i think ultimately um power is a hard thing to my mom has always said sometimes you fail the test of success and i'm worried that what's happening here is we were so hopeful for this mayor i was so hopeful for him to come in and right the ship and balance the budget and do all the right things and at so far it looks like he's he might fail the test of success and it's really heartbreaking to see and especially when people's livelihoods are on the line it's not cool. Yeah, I mean, I just feel thing. bad for all these parents out there with kids at Metro schools and yeah, the stories that I've heard of them not being able to go back to school and the effect that it's having on their children. And I mean, these are real, these are people's lives and yeah. it's not political and it shouldn't be political. And I, it's just, it's a shame that it's kind of devolved to this now. Parents unable to go back to work because the kids are staying home and out of school. I talked to a friend just the other day and she was just losing it with her kids. Her kids are way too smart to sit behind a computer all day. And she was just so upset because she has had to stop working to school her children. It's very hard. And so my hope from this is that um, this is a reckoning. This is a wake up call. This is a, all right, the public is smart. The public knows let's do things with honor and with integrity and open places up and let people act like adults. If, if we go to a restaurant, yeah, we know the risk. Really, I've never really understood that the whole concept of like people posting stuff about people being on Broadway downtown. Like, they know the you risk. don't have to go to Broadway downtown. You don't have to go to the bar. You don't have to go anywhere if you don't want to. Right. Um, and it just, it kind of boggles my mind that people care so much about what other people are doing when they don't even have to be around them if they don't want to. Welcome to America. Everybody's business is everybody's business. It's sad, but I hope this is a big wake up call. You know, I talked to someone today and we were, and he was saying that a lot of politics is when you get into the world of politics and when you start to see it from the inside, you see the sausage get made. Not everyone needs to see the sausage get made because a lot of times it's not pleasant, but the public does need to know that things like this happen. And um, now we're aware. And now I hope that the city decides to be a little more reasonable <laughs> with what they're asking of us or asking us not to do. Also, PSA, um, our board members are really savvy. And <laughs> John Cooper is wild. Real LinkedIn, like actually official LinkedIn page. Uh, we were critical of something that the mayor did in a news article or news story um, last night. Mm -hmm. And then in rapid succession today, somebody, either a staff member that has access to his LinkedIn account or the mayor himself, which would be even weirder, um, was like systematically looking at like our, all of our board members LinkedIn pages. And it was kind of creepy. I was like, who are you peeping at? It and was, why? it was why are you doing this during office hours? Like, it's so sloppy. I know. If, I mean, if you don't believe us, go look at Justin's tweet. Justin tweeted a screenshot of it. It yeah. is right <laughs> there. <laughs> now, I have no idea. Maybe they're inviting them all to to tea. I have no <laughs> To have a glass of tea. <laughs> have a glass of tea, but, like, I, I do think it's kind of creepy um, and also, like, unnecessary. Um, but I, I mostly thought it was funny. Yeah, I, I love that our board members were like on it. They were like, oh, this is I like literally laughed out loud for a few minutes. <laughs> I did too. So that was a little bit weird. So weird things are going on in the mayor's Strange office. Day. Strange they, day. 
they've been locked up too long. They've been quarantining for too long. Someone, <laughs> someone go check on the mayor's staff. <laughs> Get them out of their office. Check on them. Send them a, a cookie break or something. Like, <laughs> send them outside for a walk. Yeah, let's <laughs> get some here. Something crazy is happening. Um, in good news this week, something happened that I think that the whole world thought would never happen, which is a Middle East peace deal brokered by the United States. I, I, I was shocked. I'm equally shocked that the media is not covering it, but we'll get to that. I don't want to go into, Beacon's not a foreign relations group, so I won't go into detail, but I will say that four nations, including the U.S. and Israel, signed on to a deal that is hoping to accomplish peace in the Middle East. I, I think that this is going to be the beginnings of something really, really great for the entire world. Um, yeah, the peace deal is something that I think um, should be talked about. It's a big deal, and it's some, it's something that you know, growing up a child of the, and I know that I'm older than you, but growing up a child of the 80s and 90s, like, this is pretty monumental. There was a, a lot, you know, from the Gulf War that happened when I was growing up, like, I vividly remember we had one TV in our house and we were watching um, the troops come in um, in the Middle East during that time. And so I know that our generation has just seen a lot of unrest in that area. And I think that this is, has the potential to be a really big opportunity for that region to be stabilized. I totally agree. I think it's, um, it's a huge accomplishment. I wish the media would cover COVID less and this more, but if the media uh -huh. won't do it, we will. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> if, the, if the media won't do it, we will. So um, what a great, great thing to come from this week. Um, just wanted to touch on that ever so briefly, because like I said, Beacon's not a foreign relations group, but wanted to touch on that ever so briefly and say that I was so encouraged that people are really um, hopefully going to see peace in their region. I can't imagine living in a region that's constantly at war and in flux and in the public light. So hopefully those people can get a little breath of fresh air amid everything else that's going on. More happy news. We've got like, this is like the happy news day on the yeah. podcast. He's talking positive. We all need good news. Um, Big 10 football is back for our little Midwestern girl over here, Stephanie Whip. How do you feel? You know, I have been following the whole thing, and I thought it was ridiculous from the start. I mean, yeah. I am originally from Ohio and big football um, mm -hmm. state. Like, I mean, I know the SEC is a big football, like, right. region, but so is the Big Ten, like, huge, huge college football fans. Um, and so I, this is not unexpected to me. Like, I thought eventually that the pressure would be big enough that they would have to come to the table and say, how can we make this work? Um, yeah. Which is what they should have done from the beginning. They shouldn't have figured out a reason for it not to happen, but instead looked at, like, how can we do this safely and how can we make sure that we, we play football? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really hard when you see other teams getting ready or you see other divisions practicing or you see NFL football back to sit on the sidelines and say, we're just going to, you know, take our ball and go home because yeah. we don't so. want to work on this anymore. Um, but I really applaud, number one, the student athletes for standing up and saying yes. something um, and their families for going out on a limb and saying something. And then I've also been really following it on Clay Travis's Twitter um, because I thought that he was hilarious. And in the end of the day, he was actually right on this particular issue. Yes, he was. I'm the first to criticize Clay Travis because sometimes I think he's annoying, but <laughs> he was right. He was. And, you know, as an SEC fan, I've been making fun of the Big Ten for not playing. Now I have one less thing to make fun of the Big Ten about, but I am so glad that things are going to get back to normal for these kids. It's, you know, a lot of kids go to college on a scholarship to play football they need to keep their scholarship, but they also just love to play. It's, it's an outlet for them. It's what they've loved to do. It's their chance for a career. So let, as they say, in remember the Titans, let the boys play. Well, it's not the, it's let them play if it's safe. And it's been shown that right. it is. Um, right. And, you know, they have the opportunity to play or not play. Right. So it's up to them and let the individual players and athletes make their own decisions with their families and what's best for them. Similarly, the way that they've done in the, the NBA and the NFL. And um, again, it's about personal decisions and weighing the risks and deciding what's best for you. And that's what we should be going back to. Like, 
let's let's let people decide their own destiny for themselves. Yeah, which brings me to our last topic, which is my favorite one that we maybe have ever done. Stephanie and I are going to tell, to know what this yeah, is. <laughs> Stephanie and I are going to tell each other our favorite stupid COVID rules. There have oh. been <laughs> there have been some rules, some COVID rules that are so dumb that I cannot even handle. So let's talk about our favorite stupid COVID rules. I'll start with mine and then we can go to Stephanie. My favorite one was when Nashville extended the bars being open until 1030 the other night after the Titans game because you can't get co- you you can only get COVID after 10 p.m. at a bar every day or after 1030 when football is happening. Yeah, I think the time related ones have been my like most mind boggling restrictions, right? Like, like as the virus decides that the clock strikes, you know, 10 and we all turn into pumpkins and it starts spreading everywhere. Like that, it's just absurd. Um, I think the, the fact that they're telling people to submit a form the Nashville Health Department to submit a form if you want to have a gathering like a graduation party or something of over 25 people and then they'll review it and decide whether or not you can and they're going to take into consideration whether or not you're serving alcohol because apparently if you drink alcohol you get the coronavirus but if you don't then it it won't spread yeah and so those are the types of things that I think really get people like fired up because it doesn't make any common sense. It doesn't. And that's where they lose credibility with the public when they make these regulations that make no common sense and then try to say that it's protecting you in some way. Like if wearing a mask works, then let people wear a mask and socially distance and have gatherings. Fine. Great. But alcohol or the time of day doesn't matter. And there's no science to back that up. Yeah, the other night at my birthday dinner, I had nine friends. Three friends had to sit at their own table and six of us sat at one table because restaurants are not illegally allowed to seat more than six people at a table. All six of us came in together. We all recently went on vacation together. You think if we haven't made a decision to spend time together that sitting at a restaurant is going to give one of us COVID? Like, it's just the most insane thing. It's just micromanaging people's everyday activities is not managing a pandemic, right? Like managing a pandemic is coming up with good science-based health policy. Um, Not telling people where they can go and how they can, you know, drink or not drink or what time of day it is, is it has nothing to do with whether or not COVID spreads. Like I said, we're not like in Cinderella where the clock strikes midnight and we all, we all get COVID. We all get COVID. The virus doesn't care where you are or what you're doing. It doesn't care if you're protesting. It doesn't care if you're drinking at a bar. It doesn't care. If where you are. Church, it, yeah, or it's a football game. Like, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a virus. And I've been saying since day one, like, if my six month old can go to daycare and he has been, and so have thousands of other Nashville, um, little ones across the County, Mm -hmm. there's no reason why kids can't be back in school and the numbers don't support it. And, um, it's, it's just becoming glaringly more clear to me that it's not about the kids. It's about politics. And I think that it's really disappointing for a lot of parents. Well, that is, that is a mic drop. You heard it here first. We're not happy. And I love how Stephanie words things. She words it so eloquently because I'm over here screaming and about to break a lamp. Like, <laughs> you know, I don't know about that. I just, I get, I mean, Taylor, you hear my rants. I just get really fired up when I see injustice with people and, um, and how it's impacting their everyday life. And I think that this is one of those examples that, you know, we're going to look back on this and really think, wow, like, what did we do? We really, we really got this wrong. And the next time that there is something that comes around that is more deadly, um, it's going to be interesting to see how the public reacts to it, because I think they're going to be a little bit more wary of listening to health officials. And that to me is the scariest prospect. Trust is shot. At least for me, it is. I mean, every, everyone can speak for themselves, but the trust is, is shot. I'm going to, I'm, uh, we're of course very safe at our, at the Beacon office. We do wear our masks yeah. when we go out. We do s- socially distance in the office. We're being safe, but at the same time we're adults and we're making that decision. And I think that 
our, our elected officials could do a little bit better with letting adults make adult decisions with how we Absolutely. stay safe during the pandemic. Because there, it's, it's not just one factor. There are multiple factors that go into a decision for a family and they all need to be taken into consideration. There's no way that public health officials know all those factors um, for those individuals and, and they need to be able to have the autonomy to make those decisions. Yes. So um, I said today we should make some uh, like a instead of our just our pork report, we should have like a dumb rules report <laughs> that the puts out. I don't know if I'm going to get the green line on that, but I'll be working on it. You'll have to um, talk to Justin about that one. Justin, I can't convince. I, I can't convince Justin, but I can try. <laughs> you can try. You can try. I can do my best. Thank Let you. the girl do it. Let me do it, Justin. Come on. This will th give the people what they want. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me this week, Stephanie. We will see everyone next week on a new episode. Make sure you share below. Share. Share it with everybody.